Hello viewers, my name is Tim Rusick and I am assigned here at Portage Central High School as a technician. Today though, I have a new assignment and that assignment is to introduce a new four-part series that focuses on the school instructional staff. The goal in this series is simple, to provide the viewer with a better understanding of the teaching profession and the people drawn to it. We hope your understanding develops from the subject matter presented in classes the interest of the teacher's chosen topic, or a discussion of the professional duties required by the district and state. Take note that the topics discussed or presented are driven by the interest of the staff members exclusively. This series is about them for you. Now let's begin with Mr. Mark Yulman, who volunteered to be our inaugural featured teacher to kick off this series. We will begin with Mark in a Q&A session and then pick up a lecture he presented to his students. Thank you for watching. All right, so I'm here with Mr. Mark Yulman, and um, we're going to ask a couple questions, get a couple answers from him before we start his presentation later on in the video. So let's start out with um, how many years you've been teaching. Okay, so 24. This is my 24th year. Um, 20th at Port Central. Okay. Uh, did my student teaching here um, with Bob uh, Walker and Tom Monroe, and uh, then. Graduated, got hired at um, Harper Creek High School, taught for four years there, and had a chance to come back here, and I did, so. Sounds good. 24. 24, all right. Um, you said that you uh, you didn't go to school here at Portland. No. You went no. to Harper, right? You said Harper Creek. No, I, I'm from uh, Bay City. Bay City. Went to Bay right. City John Glenn High School. Okay. Go Bobcats. <laughs> all right, so you graduated from there. Did you, uh, or I'm sorry, did you graduated from uh, college where? Western. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Western Michigan. Um, did you did you start your freshman year? No, I didn't actually. Western no. To, to begin in no, teaching? No. No. I actually started at a community college near us. I had a chance to play college basketball there. Okay. Um, so I, I went there for two years, Delta Community College, and then transferred down here. A lot of my friends. Uh, had come down here. We're on the baseball team at Western, and and I I, I liked it down here. I was mm -hmm. recruited for football to come play down here. And it was the first time I'd ever been to Kalamazoo, and I kind of always had it in the back of my head that I would like to come back here. Okay, and that's that's kind of why I settled on Western. Right. Yeah. But did you intend to go in the education field? Not right away. I, I was probably like a lot of freshmen. I, I I wasn't real sure. I knew I wanted to be involved in in coaching. Um, but there was part of me too that that uh, had a had a interest in business. Um, but after my freshman year of college, I, it just kind of clicked, and I'm uh -huh. like, you know, this is not what I want to be doing. I, I really need to be in a classroom environment. I need to be teaching, and, and you know, I'm, I'm forever 16. Right, know? right. You, you kind of always are right. uh, when you're a high school teacher. So <laughs> I, that's just I just figured it out. That's that's what I went into. I wish I could feel that way. Well, the difference is. Uh, Physically, right. physically you don't feel right. it. Okay, okay. But there's mentally. days mentally you, you can't help but feel that way. Um, okay, so um, if you were to contrast your high school educational experience with what you see students experiencing now, what comes to mind, positive or negative? Our music was way better. Right. Uh, no offense, kids. It just was. Um, there's not many heavy rock rockers no, left No, no, there's, there's not. I, I, I you know, there, you put on Dio and they don't even know what it is. Right. Um, stress. Overwhelmingly, the stress on these kids is greater than it was on us. I, and I'm not saying we didn't have stress to perform well academically or in extracurriculars. We did. But I just, I think the social media thing is a complete game changer for these kids. So the stress is from their peers or from their parents, you think? All of it. And it's all just focused through social I, media? I do, I do. I, I think when kids have issues with friends, parents, coaches, teachers, they go to social media. Right. They, that's where they vent because it's easier that way. Um, and quite often they'll probably find somebody who feels the same way. And right. That's really what we look for when we're when we're this age. We yeah. look for people that have similarities. Well, like exactly. Right. Exactly. And and you know, back in, in our day you, you didn't have that. Um, I, I don't even know what the comparison would be. Talking right. on talking on the phone. 
Which was stuck to a wall with a long st- cord. <laughs> exactly. You, know, you couldn't even leave the room, really. <laughs> right. You had, to you, talk, you had to talk to your yeah. friends with your parents there. Exactly. Or, or you purchased, with your own money, one of the real long cords where you could close your bedroom you close door. The door. Right. right. But right. that was that didn't happen very often. But it, it, that definitely on the negative side, it's the stress. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I, I think these kids have a lot more opportunities too. Right. You know, both in, in um, what their what there's offered here at Port Central, and then what their options are when they leave. You know, college, two year college, vocationals, whatever. Okay. At the time of this filming, students uh, you will be instructing will study subjects such as um, uh, sociology mm-hmm. and international studies, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I know that there are districts and I know that there are district and state goals for this field of study, but on a personal level, what do you want your students to take away from this class or from these classes? Yeah, I mean, they're both different, so it's going to be kind of different answers, but I'll, I'll try to throw them into one. Okay, um, or you pick one. Yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, number one, you want, you want kids to be aware of the world around them. Um, and I guess that's a positive of social media sometimes is that it's very hard to not know what's going on because of trending topics, you know, um, wh- whether it's something that happens in the Middle East, something that happens in Washington, D.C., kids see it pretty quickly. But it's still my job to be able to then explain that to them because it's one thing for them to just see that something happened, and it's a whole other thing to explain it and to be able to say, this is why this is happening. This this is is a, a reason for it. This is what could come of it. Um, to to go make them think a little more critically about what it is. Um, in terms of the class itself, it's it, I'm a history person. I'm a political science mm-hmm. person. I, the old saying is, if you don't learn your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Right. We do that all the time, and. You know, so what I try to get kids to understand, especially in the international studies course, is because it's mostly Cold War. You know, mm-hmm. you and I grew up with. Right. Uh, this is vastly different. You know, we didn't go to bed necessarily worried that the Russians were going to launch nukes, but we knew it was a possibility. Right. Um, this is a whole new world uh, that, that's very, very different, and and I want kids to go back into the Cold War and see exactly how we got here. Right. Because there's there's a popcorn trail, you know, uh, that, that goes back there, and um, and as far as sociology, the, the biggest theme I have with that class is by the time that we're done, I want kids to be able to look at other people, put themselves in their shoes, and then think twice about what they're going to do, what they're going to say, because it's so easy for us to stereotype and to generalize with other people without putting ourselves in their position. And that's a that's probably really important right now because of social media to go back to Huge. that because yeah. and and because it's just it's it's there. I mean, it's unavoidable. Takes, yeah, it's unavoidable. Even if you delete it, somebody's going to take a screen print. It's it, always there. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's one thing that it doesn't matter how much we talk to the kids about that. Right. The internet doesn't disappear. It's no, it's no. there. It's right. there. I mean, there's companies that say they can scrub it, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Um, I understand um, kind of looking the it's talking about the internet um, yeah kind of looking you up mm-hmm. a little bit I understand mm-hmm. that you have a side project uh, and um, how did this come about maybe you want to explain it to us uh, it's my third child okay uh, <laughs> no offense Callie and Bradshaw uh, I have a website called steelcityblitz.com um, I have been a lifelong Pittsburgh Steelers fan I did not know that. Uh, going back to the age of about uh, one and a half or two, so the story uh, goes, that um, I, I saw Terry Bradshaw on TV on one Sunday afternoon, and I was enamored with what I was seeing, <laughs> and, you know, a shirt later, a hat later, and you're a fan. Right. Um, and I've always had uh, strong opinions on the team, um, both positive and negative, and I just met people as the internet expanded and and I wrote some things and, and some people said you know you really ought to have your own site you, you do pretty well at this mm-hmm. and so that's how it started um, and and we're we're a fairly well respected site we're not the biggest we're not the best but we're, we're a well respected site and we we put time into it I've got a cadre of people out and across the country even in Europe really? that, oh yeah that, uh. that help out uh, I've got people in Portland, Oregon, <laughs> Pittsburgh, PA, 
uh, all over the place. Wow. You know that, that we all we talk on a daily basis. So it's that's a, that's it's pretty, become a yeah, that's pretty interesting. It it's, is. It's become it's, a monster. It's more, is it more? It's I don't. It, I guess it's more than a hobby. Right, I mean, it's probably it's, it's more yeah. because especially if you compare it to your children, I, well, it's got to be a little bit more than a hobby. You don't raise your hobby, right, your right. as a hobby. No, <laughs> again, sorry, honey, sorry. Um, it's uh, I've always said that if it stops being fun, then I'm not going to do it. And and a lot of these sites will will actually pay people to write and pay people to do mm. stuff and. I'm not doing that. I want people that do it because they love the Pittsburgh Steelers, right. and we like the camaraderie of talking about it, of yelling and screaming at each other over it, arguing over it, and and so I, I'm not going to get into that. It's not it's not going to make me retire from teaching. Right. Let's put it that right. way. Uh, anytime soon. <laughs> That's cool though. That was, yeah. that was an interesting one. Fine. <laughs> um, okay, so. Uh, after this interview here, we're going to go, you know, the next thing that in the um, in the video is right. going to be your lecture. I mean, you going to give our viewers uh, a brief uh, summation of the topic. So what I chose to do is something from my sociology class. We have um, a unit that is about socialization, which discusses uh, us as human beings, essentially from birth through death and how people that we come in contact with influence our lives. Um, you know, if we're a toddler and we have a babysitter that's very influential with us, that person's mm -hmm. lessons can last a lifetime. Sure. Um, much in the same way, unfortunately, kids can have horrible experiences that last a lifetime. All right. Because of my situation early in life with my parents being divorced, um, I had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with my maternal grandparents. And my grandfather, was very influential with me. Um, he, he was a former Marine and a guy that uh, very unique late life experience of, of seeing his wife pass on, mourning, and then dating again <laughs> in your mid-70s. Right. <laughs> and, and what I try to pre impress upon my students when I talk about this is that our senior citizens, our older people in our community can go through the same types of emotions that kids walk in these halls can. You know, love, hate, jealousy, uh, happiness, excitement, enthusiasm, all of that. And, and I think sometimes we just look at old people and say, you're old. Right. You know, and right. we, don't, we don't remember the value. Uh, that, that they had, that they have, that they will have. Mm -hmm. And so I have used my grandfather's story in the class now for roughly 15 years about how he, he dated, got remarried, had some awesome years with his, his second wife, and, and, um, and then eventually you know passed on. But what his influences were on me, why I became a teacher is, is definitely part of his influence. All right. um, and, and so it's usually one of my favorite parts of the class and the kids. The kids at first are kind of like, why is he telling us all this? Right. You know, and then by the end of it, they're they're usually like, I get it. Right. I get it. Right. You know, I know what he's saying now, and and they and they tend to view their own grandparents maybe just a tad different when right. it's done. Maybe maybe understand why they do what they do, say what they say a little bit more. As our viewers um, may not know, is that this is uh, filmed out of sequence, so I, we've already mm -hmm. filmed this. Uh, uh, the, the your. Um, what do I want to say? Your uh, the lecture. presentation, lecture, yeah, yeah. Lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but it, after seeing that and, and watching it and listening to it, um, I had another question that I'm putting in here now. Yeah, um, is that like like you? I had, I was influenced by my grand my grandmother, my, my okay. paternal grandmother. Okay, and um, I had a lot of uh, a lot of interactions with her, and I've often thought. Why do we as a society disregard people who have life experiences and celebrate youth that doesn't have wisdom gathered through the years? Um, I mean, I know it's a very broad topic, but maybe you've got a brief idea that um, you could... Well, share. thankfully we have a couple of built-in examples here. Um, first and foremost, I think what happens is our society is, is in such a hurry all the time. And as you and I both know, you get older, you start slowing down a little bit, mm -hmm. and the rest of society keeps moving. I look up at Vinny's Coffee Shop in our library. Right, right. And Betty Keenbaum, 
former social studies teacher here, mm -hmm. Bob Walker, my mentor teacher, former social studies teacher here, right. are both senior citizens. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And they yeah. are consistently among the most favorite people our kids have talk about here. That tells me that our kids understand that senior citizens play a very important role in our lives because they, to me, they will always be walking history. It doesn't matter if they were at an event or, or saw the event, but if they were alive for things that these kids weren't, it gives them a perspective and something to think about that they might not have ever thought about. And I, I just, I, I think it's incredibly valuable. You, you had a personal experience with it. I've had a personal experience with it. And, and that's why it, it becomes important to me. Okay, great. Um, so do you have any parting thoughts that you'd like to give to us about regarding education or anything that's on your mind? Well, I'd like to thank you, Tim, because oh, well, thank uh, you very much. I, what the audience doesn't know is I'm the guinea pig. I'm the first one <laughs> to do this. Will. I am number one. Uh, there will be others that follow and do this. You can only I, go down from here. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been terrific. Uh, but thank you, and, and you know, uh, as far as education and stuff, you know, number one thing, be here. Yeah. There is, be here. Right. Don't, I understand kids are, are anxious and they have uh, highs and lows every day, just like the rest of us, but man, the success rate drops dramatically when kids aren't here. Absolutely. Be here. We'll help you. We'll do our best and, and I want to make it, and kids know that they have me in class, I want to make it a well, learning right. and fun environment. I mean, we have huge buildings dedicated to yeah. the education of children, so but yeah. it only works if they're here. Right. That's, that's well said. I, you said the best thing. There. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I thank you, uh, Mark. I uh, appreciate it for being a guinea pig. And, my uh, pleasure. <laughs> we'll move on from here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. All right. All right. Uh, okay, guys. Again, thank you for being here. And um, you know, as part of our discussion of socialization, you know, we talk about birth through death—the people that come into our lives at any stage, whether we're little kids, whether we're our teenagers, um, middle-aged, or all the way up through senior citizens. People are constantly coming in and out of our life. Some will make a huge difference. Some that you will see, meet, forget, and never, ever, ever think about again. All right. So one of the things that I have done in this since I've been um, teaching sociology is talk about my grandfather, okay? And to give you kind of a little bit of background, my parents divorced at a young age. I was about four. And I had a younger brother. And so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, probably more than most kids, because my mom worked, okay? The only way to support the family. Um, so I got very close with them, but in particular, my grandfather. And um, a lot of, I guess, who I am, what I am, is because of some of the influences that, that I got from him. And I'll share some of those things as we go. Um, but I, I, the big thing is, is why old people matter. And when I say old people, I don't mean to be disrespectful. We're just using that as a term. Senior citizens, that's probably a better term, okay? So let me introduce you to my grandfather, okay? Um, his name was Earl, a tremendous early 20th century name. Okay, we don't see too many people named that anymore. Um, he was born in Bay City, Michigan, and, and you can see Bay City is right up there. So if, if we all do the whole mitten thing with our hand, it's literally in the thumb pit, if you will, of Michigan. That's where I was born, and that's where he was born. Um, he went to Bay City Central High School and then entered the U.S. Marines not long after that. Um, this was in the 1930s. Um, I know a lot of people like to be able to talk about their grandfather in the sense that he stormed the beaches of Normandy. Our grandfather didn't do that. Um, he was out of the Marine Corps by the late 30s. Uh, but what he did get to do, some of you might remember the story of the Hindenburg, the big Zeppelin in New Jersey that exploded. Okay. He was there. He was one of the Marine guards of the hangars. And if you go back and look at the old footage, and again, that's 1937, you can actually see my grandfather running around trying to help. Um, so while he didn't serve in World War II, he still had a pretty, pretty awesome story to be able to relate to me as I got older. Um, 
Once he left the Marine Corps, he worked for the power company in Bay City, Electric Light and Power. He was a foreman, so whenever the power went out, he and his crews would go out. They were the guys climbing the poles and, and doing all of the work to get our power back up and running, okay? This picture of him is his basketball uniform, believe it or not. Guys, would you play basketball if you had to wear that outfit today? Yes. There is no way. There is no way you could. Um, <laughs> I don't even know. What, it looks like a lifeguard uniform from the 20s, but, um, but that was actually a basketball uniform, okay? Um, he ended up uh, marrying uh, a woman named Mildred, who was my grandmother, and I'll show you her in a second. And they were married over 50 years. Um, and lived every bit of it in Bay City, Michigan. My grandfather built his own house, built it from scratch, um, and, and therefore I knew that house quite well. I can still see that house as if it's right in front of me. I know every inch of it, um, and, and it's, it's just an incredible feeling all these years later. He had two daughters and a son and ultimately seven grandkids, so not a ton of family, but um, definitely a good family, and, and uh, one, of, one of the things I want to point out to you, this is right before they married. This is my grandparents. This is probably some point in the 1920s, um, early, late, late 20s, early 30s. He dressed, kind of looks a little bit like a mafioso, you know, an Al Capone type in the 20s. And that is them at their 50th wedding anniversary. Um, funny story about that, it was held at this really nice place. It was on a Saturday, and Michigan was playing a really big game. And this was in the days when they, they weren't really on TV much, so I kept running back and forth from the resort uh, place to the car to listen to the game to see how Michigan was doing. Side note. Um, both my grandparents were smokers. Going over to family events at my grandparents, it was my mom, my brother, and I were the only ones in the entire family who didn't smoke. So you kind of walked into a fog bank. And it's a wonder I don't have lung cancer yet, okay? But you can kind of just tell, you know? Um, why do I bring up my grandfather as we talk about socialization and, and old age and people that impact us, okay? <laughs> I was your age when my grandmother passed away. Okay, I'll never forget it because I came home from high school basketball practice. Um, it was a November, early November day. It was kind of nice out that day. I remember running uh, from the mailbox and I had to negotiate some steps to get to my front door and when I jumped, I missed a step and ended up with a massive cut right along my shin. And it wasn't like a half hour later we got the call that my grandmother had passed away. And so we immediately hopped in the car. We went to my, my grandparents' house, and, and, and I remember seeing my grandfather just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything other than he was just very stoic. He didn't really know, and he, he was a Marine. He was a guy that wasn't going to show you a ton of, of emotion. And so we just kind of, we were there for him, so to speak. Now, my grandfather doted on my grandmother. You guys understand what doted means? Doted is loved, cared for, did everything for, went out of his way for. Let me give you an example. My grandmother used to go, and, and they only had one car, and she would refuse to drive. So my grandfather would drive her to her beauty appointments, and he'd sit in the car for an hour and a half and wait. He would often take her to Kmart. Okay? Now this was in the days when Kmart was a big thing. You guys ever hear of the blue light special? Kmart used to have this, this box on wheels and it had a tall flashing blue light at the top. And they would pull the, the blue light around the store and wherever there was a big special, they would turn the light on and it was a blue light special. Thus the name. He would take my grandmother there and sit in the car and wait. And when my brother and I would be with him, we would always laugh because we could see the blue light moving and we always pictured our grandmother chasing after, the, <laughs> chasing after the blue light. I learned how to play a lot of I Spy at that time because we were so bored waiting in the car. But that's, he doted on it. He did, he did everything for her. He was just, he was very proper. He, he would have never 
um, burped in public. He would have never done anything to embarrass her or, or anybody. He was just a proper guy, you know? So by the end of that year, Thanksgiving was just a few weeks after the funeral. My grandfather came out to our house, and, and it was rough, uh, a lot of emotion. And then we got to Christmas. And Christmas of that year was interesting. We invited my grandfather over for Christmas morning because we, didn't, we just didn't want him to be alone. So it was going to be my mom and my brother and I. And I got up about 6.30 in the morning just to use the restroom. I was not getting up to go down and check out the presents. I just go to the bathroom. As I'm returning to my bedroom, I notice lights going on in the neighborhood. And so I go to the window and I look, and I hear what sounds like sleigh bells, okay, Santa Claus. It's still very dark. In my mind, I'm still thinking, okay, if it was him, he would have already been here by now. So now I see the headlights coming down the road, but I can't quite see the car yet. And as, as it gets closer, it clears the house next door to me, and I see it's my grandfather's car. And he's got the window rolled down, and he's got a strand of sleigh bells about this big, and he's ringing them outside the, the car. And these are loud. I don't know if you guys have heard of sleigh bells, but they can be really, really loud. He proceeds to go all the way down and around the loop and then come back and pull in our driveway. So he has now awakened the entire neighborhood. All right, everybody's now up for Christmas, whether they want it to be or not. So I've gone downstairs, I kind of go, I open the door and I'm like, I've never seen this behavior from my grandfather. I mean, he was a funny, he could be funny, but this was just so out of character. So he gets out of the car and he just, this smile just comes across his face like something I'd never seen on him before. And what was cool about my grandfather, he had a big gap in his middle of his teeth. I mean, you could have drove a truck through it. <laughs> but that was him, that was his personality. Okay. So what I didn't know is that was the beginning of this metamorphosis, you science people, this change that somebody in his 70s was now going to go through something that me, a high school student, was like, old people don't do this. <laughs> so it was weird. A couple months after Christmas, I, I get a phone call from him. And he says, hey, uh, he always called me Chum or Bub. I don't think he ever called me by my first name. He's always Chum or Bub. Hey, Bub, come on over. I, I want you to show you, I'm going to show you something. Okay, everything all right? Yeah, yeah, come on over. I want to show you this. So I take 10 minutes, I drive over to his house. Off the driveway at my grandfather's, you, you can open the door and you have two directions. You either go straight downstairs to the basement or you go up a little stoop into the main house. So I hear him in the basement. Hey, hey, John, John, come on down here. Okay. So I start going down there and I open the door and he's standing there and he says, you, you, you gotta see this. Okay, so as we get closer to it, I hear this rumbling and I realize the rumbling is bubbling bubbles. And I'm like, what? Did you break the, the, the washing machine? What, you know, what's going on? He's purchased a jacuzzi, <laughs> a hot tub. All right. And it's now in the corner of the basement. And this is pretty cool. All right. I always called him Gramps. I'm like, Gramps, hey, that's neat. Then I started to notice some things. He had little like decorations, you know, like, like like palm trees, you know. But then I see these, he's, he's put up some hooks for towels. Yeah, I mean, he's made it his own little resort. So I see a towel and I see his swim trunks. And then I couldn't help but notice another towel and a woman's bathing suit. 
again, I'm your age, guys, at this time. So you can only imagine what I'm thinking, right? So I kind of look at him and I'm like, uh, Gramps, one of two things is going on here. Um, you, and he just kind of stopped me and he says, well, that belongs to Hazel. So at that moment, I realized that my grandfather, who I never dreamed in a million years, is dating. Okay? He's dating. Hazel was a longtime family friend. And so he, they started dating, going to dinner, and, and, and I believe he used the term taking a soak. It was something like, yeah, we, we like to take a soak, you know, something like that. And so I've got all kinds of heebie-jeebies at this time. You know, you know. Um, yeah. So this was, again, this, this movement of, of something that I wasn't familiar with, with my grandfather. And because I was really the first one in the family to know about this, you know, he hadn't really said anything to his own children, my mother uh, and, and her brother and sister. And, and so I, you, you got to see what, what Graham's got. What do you mean? Well, he's got a hot tub. Oh, no, he doesn't. Well, you're going to have to stop by. Everybody was stunned. This was so unlike him. Well, as the months went by, he keeps dating Hazel. He gets a new car, okay? Brand new Buick LeSabre. Fancy. Four doors. Prior, he used to just have an old blue Monte Carlo. And by the way, blue was my grandmother's favorite color. The whole house was blue. I mean blue, blue, okay? Like, like the color of these chairs and maybe the color of like lighter blue jeans. Blue, everything was blue. So not only does he get the hot tub and does he get the new car, but now we start to go over to the house more often and the house is no longer blue. He's painted it. It's all neutral colors now. So now, for me, it's like, yeah, hey, this is pretty cool. But you know, for his kids, this was, you're forgetting about your mom, your, your, your wife. Why, how could you do this? You know, that kind of thing. And I remember those conversations. And he's like, oh, no, that's not what it's about. It's just time for change. So as I got older and I went to college at Western, um, I. I Unfortunately, he went through a breakup first. He and Hazel split spill. You know, he was he was getting a little too serious for her. She had some kids. True story. Her grandkids went to Port Central High School. Weird, right? Weird. Okay. Um, so they break up. It's like, Grandpa, you gonna be okay? Oh, you know, I'll be fine. Okay. Um, it wasn't that much later. Um, when he met Mary. Yeah, apparently my grandfather was a player. Okay? Um, that's Mary. Okay? So Mary actually went to high school with my grandfather. They graduated together in the same class. All right? In the early 30s. Her husband had died not too much longer. Uh, or right around the same time as my grandmother. They started going out, having dinner. They would come out to our house and have dinner. And she was, oh my God, this woman could bake like you wouldn't believe. I mean, pies, cookies. I mean, I can, I can literally taste some of the foods that she used to do right now. I mean, it was that good. So then came the strangest phone call I think I've ever had at, at that point in my young life. My grandfather calls and says, hey, I need to ask you something. And I'm like, okay. He says, I want you to, to stand at my wedding. Now again, I know I've said this many times so far. I was roughly your age, 17, 18, 19 years old, standing at your grandfather's wedding. That's cute. Oh, it's, it's great, but it's so weird, you know? And so in, in June of... 91, I think, they got married, okay? So um, they moved into his house, which was great. You know, didn't have to learn a new house or any of that kind of stuff. And, and it was wonderful. She had a big family, and, and so the families, you know, got along. And in fact, my, my mom 
uh, is still tremendous friends with her oldest daughter. And I mean, it's just one of these things, okay? But I, I want to go back to this. Once I came down to Western, um, I, I came home as often as I could. It's about a three-hour drive, give or take, especially if the police are on I-69. Um, and I always stopped at my grandfather's before I went to my house. And one day, much like today, I pull up in his driveway. He didn't know I was coming home that weekend. And because I was smart and always scheduled my classes for you no know, classes on Friday, it's a good lesson for you college kids, I left Thursday. So I pull in the driveway and I see he's sitting in front of his garage and he's, he's got this brand new wood chipper that he's extremely proud of. He's talked to me on the phone about it several times. He's really, really proud of it, proud of it. And I, hey, Gramps, you know, and oh, hey, hey, come on over here, come on over. And he's talking to me as if we'd seen each other five minutes before, you know. And I mean, he wasn't a hug guy or anything like that. It was usually a handshake type thing. So totally fine. So he says, hey, I need your help with this. Okay. He said, a little nut. He said, and, he, and he holds up his hand. He's like, what this big? He said, I lost it. It went down the chute. And he said, you know, he's like, my arms aren't long enough. I can't reach it. He said, I think you can reach it. And so, naturally, what's your first question to someone who's standing in front of a wood chipper? You know, is, is this on? It's not going to come on. Don't want to lose my arm. And, oh, no, it's fine. It's gas powered. It's not started. Don't worry about it. it it'll be fine. So I, I roll up my sleeve. Down I go. I am up into the wood chipper, up to my shoulder. Okay. I can, I'm feeling around, I'm feeling around, I'm feeling around. Finally, I grab it. I can feel the nut. It's, I'm just like, Grandpa, I got it. Just as I say that, he rips a huge fart. Okay. And immediately says, hey, it's starting up. Get your hand out of there. And I just, I pulled out like that because he scared me so much and the nut goes flying. Kind of like the nuts in the Christmas story when he changed the tire. And I just, I, 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 I kind of fall back on my, my backside and I look in front of him and I get the big, you know, gap in the teeth. And, and, and he's just laughing. He, he's totally hysterical. And I thought to myself, there is no way you would have ever done something like that if Grandma were still alive. I didn't say it to him, but I was thinking it. And it was true. It was true. He wouldn't have. And part of me to this day, I still think that he planned that all along. Like, as soon as he saw me pull up, he's like, okay, I got it. You know, this is going to be great. So part of why I became a teacher is my grandfather. I didn't realize it until later in life. Because one of the things I used to do with my grandfather as a kid was he would quiz me on state and national capitals. He would, only, he would just randomly select countries and states and say, what's the capital? He would randomly open up an encyclopedia and say, what flag is this? Who does this belong to? And we would actually talk politics, even when I was like eight or nine years old. How bizarre is that? In fact, I remember the 1980 presidential election. I was at his house, and he had voted that day. And I said, hey, Gramps, who'd you vote for? And he snapped right around at me, and he said, we don't ever talk about that. And I'm like, sorry. You know, he said, that is something between the person that votes and nobody else. You don't talk about who we vote for. And, and so the more I learned about that, and now, <laughs> don't forget, what was, what was it, excuse me, 2016 when Justin Timberlake like, took a selfie with his ballot, you know, and everybody went nuts. You shouldn't do that. Well, that was kind of the point of my grandfather. You know, that's something you don't talk about because we don't want problems outside of, uh, in our society about that, about who we vote for, and look where we are now, you know. What I, the downside of this, guys, is that as my grandfather got into his late 70s and early 80s, his health started to go. And I fully admit, and it's very, very difficult, that I started to avoid going to see my grandfather. Because of the fact I didn't like seeing him the way he was, with an oxygen thing in his nose and carrying a tank around. But I also knew I was going to hear the same stories. 
over and over and over and over again. And I know some of you can relate to that. Some of you have family members that it's like, oh, let's see them again. Because you know they're going to ask you the same questions and you're going to get, get you know, the same jokes, the same one-liners, all that stuff. And what I would tell you is that they are truly living history. You know, I told you that he was there when the Hindenburg exploded. He got a chance to go up with, with a pilot and fly right down Broadway in the middle of the night in New York City with all the neon lights. I mean, there's very few people that ever get to do stuff like that. So they really are. They're living history. Talk to them. And I can guarantee you, if, I, if, if, if one day, just one moment, I would love to hear my grandfather tell one story that I've already heard a thousand times. And I, I know you guys would get to that point, too. So don't take it for granted, OK? Understand that senior citizens, just like he did, he went through excitement. He had the excitement of having a hot tub, of, of having a new car, of having a girlfriend, of being married again. Okay? He, you know, he went through the, the awful feeling of, of loss when my grandmother died, the regret, you know, or was it a life fulfilled, all these types of things. And as I close this, they say that, that genetics, I guess, tells you what type of hair you're going to have as an adult. And they say that as a man, you always look at your mother's father and see what his hair was like. My grandfather died in 2000 with a really, really nice head of hair. <laughs> Don't believe science. Sorry, science teacher. But guys, that's what I want you to understand, is that, that for every time you get mad at an old person because they're slowing up a line, every time they, they, they don't turn fast enough on center off of Westage, or something like that, just remember they've had a full life and they deserve our patience. At least most of them. I mean, some are just downright me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so questions? None? Beautiful. My grandfather, like I told you, um, smoked almost his entire life, um, and he developed COPD. Um, and it, you know, it's it's funny Emma, because he told me late in life he wished he never stopped smoking because he swears he would have stayed healthy. And he and I'm dead serious about that. A lot of people in the 70s and 80s believed that when we were just starting to learn that that tobacco caused cancer and all these things. He really did. He truly believed that he should have just kept his lifestyle the way it was and he would have lived longer. He died at 84, so it's a good life. But yeah, this is funny. That? What? When was that? When was? When he died. The year 2000. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, passed away and, and we had a, a, a funeral, you know, not a big funeral. Um, just a uh, kind of a memorial and then a burial and it was real quiet and everything and Mary Mary actually lived um, into her 90s and passed away a few years ago um, yeah and you know uh, we, we still had her over at Christmas and stuff like that and she she was kind of an assisted living towards the end but you know it's uh, it, they really are they're just really interesting you know stories and hopefully you enjoyed it and hopefully Hopefully what happens is, you know, you take something from it and look at your own grandparents or a grandparent and, you know, you get something out of that relationship too. Okay. All right. Thank you guys. Um, let us head back to class. You don't have to class. Thank you, though.